morning and thanks for coming. I'm going to talk today about genetic research and how we're doing it wrong and how, <laughs> how we ought to be looking for mutations that are helpful instead of harmful. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. One is the AIDS epidemic. When AIDS was first identified in the 1980s, uh, researchers asked for sexually active gay men to come and uh, take part in their research so they could establish a risk criteria. But what they couldn't understand was why some of the men in the high risk group in every single research study never developed positive HIV. Two of the men were Erich and Steven. Um, they decided to join another study who was looking for this pocket of individuals who did not contract AIDS and yet had high risk behaviors. They found a gem of a find. They both had a deletion on chromosome three that's responsible for making the receptor sites for T cells, which is the main entry point for AIDS into the body. So Eric and Steven, while they were waiting for years to develop HIV, were actually flushing it right through their bodies. The pharmaceutical companies were quick to follow and make antagonists to block the T cells on the receptor sites so that the AIDS virus couldn't infiltrate the systems. And that's the mainstay of treatment today. And we're not just making strides by looking at good mutations for AIDS, but also for osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol. But my favorite story is about a family in Washington who has a dominant allele for um, early onset Alzheimer's. 13 members in that family started with um, early signs of dementia in their 40s and were dead by the time they were in their mid-50s. One of the men, Doug Whitney, was part of the family and he did not want to be tested, but he said every day from the time he was 40, he waited and thought, this will be the day where I slip, where I can start to feel I'm different but it never happened. And on his 62nd birthday, he decided to be tested. And to everyone's surprise, he carried the dominant allele. And so now they're calling him Exhibit A because somewhere in his body, he is either prolonging the onset or it totally making it so that that um, early onset Alzheimer gene never activates. And so that brings us to my prodigies, which seems kind of an awkward transition, but it's not. <laughs> You'll understand why when I get to the end. Um, I didn't start my graduate work studying child prodigies. As a matter of fact, I was being trained on the mental retardation grant, and I was working in a clinical class with a young girl named Carla. She was 11 years old. She weighed 44 pounds. She had no speech. She had no pain receptors, and she was quite the biter. And every day, I'd take her to school during that semester and be the liaison with her family and go back to the family and say what Carla was working on, which was like sometimes I could get her to um, turn the pages of a magazine. That's how our days went. She wasn't interested in eating. It was very difficult. And during the same time, another researcher came out and said, all you have to do to be exceptional is to start young and practice for 10 deliberate years. And I kind of felt like it was insult to injury. There was no one in Carla's class that no matter how, long they, how young they were or how long they practiced that was going to reach the range of acceptability in, in any venue. And so I came up with a different theory. Um, I said that it must be general intelligence, domain-specific skills, and practice time that aids in people's levels of achievement. And I was testing it out on a self-selected high school band, which meant if you were wanting to join the band, you could join the band. And I compared them to highly selected conservatory students. And on each one of the variables, the conservatory students scored higher than the self-selected high school band. And it was while I was doing that, my husband came home with a magazine and said, if you're also interested in exceptional performers, how about this kid on the cover? And I looked at it, and it was a little six-year-old from the South. I thought, oh, this will be fascinating because if I'm right, he'll have an IQ that's off the charts. His domain-specific skill in music will be at the 99th percentile because he hasn't had a lot of time to practice. 
So I called his parents, and it was good. I got the answering machine so they could think about it. And six months later, I was down in New Orleans, and this little boy who had no formal lessons had produced two CDs in English and French, been in movies, um, was being tested. And I was giving him the Stanford Binet because I wanted a fuller range of his IQ. And I added the Gordon's Test of Musical Audiation to see what his musical capacities were. And while I was testing him, I was surprised that his full-scale IQ was not 150 off the charts. He was gifted, it was 132, but it wasn't what I was expecting. But what was exceptional was his working memory. And so he had this extraordinary working memory. He never forgot anything. He buzzed right through the test, hit the top criteria for someone who's an adult, even though he was only six years old. And then um, he got tired of me. And he said, Miss Joanne, I don't want to do this anymore. And I said, OK, what do you want to do? He said, I want to go to McDonald's. So I said, <laughs> OK. Let me ask your mother. So she said, sure, we can take a break. We'll go to McDonald's. And um, <laughs> while we were sitting there eating our Happy Meals, his only maternal cousin walked in just by chance with his mother. And the two sisters were chatting. And a young teenage boy stood behind his mother, grunting and groaning and flapping his hands. And when they left the table, the prodigy's mother said to me, my nephew has autism and the light went off, and I thought, what are the chances in one family of having a child prodigy and autism? And so I added to the next eight prodigies the autism spectrum quotient, and I asked those families if they had autism in their families. And of the nine families, over 50% had one to five relatives, direct first or second degree relatives with autism. They also scored higher on the um, autistic spectrum quotient in the category of attention to detail than the actual people with autism, and they all had these extraordinary memories. So with all this information in hand, I was able to get a grant and take a look to see if the autistic relatives and the child prodigies were related genetically. And sure enough, we got a hit on chromosome one that shows that they have um, shared molecular etiology with each other, and now, we're in a collaboration with Miguel, who is paying for the whole thing, and we are looking for the good gene, the prodigy gene, that was, is holding back the deficits that are associated with autism and only allowing the talent to shine through. And if we find it, it won't be just better medicine for individuals with autism, but we believe it'll be better medicine for people with disabilities, too. Thank you.